really think they know something about this world. Everything already been planned and been organized and been created already. Every, every single moment of our life already been set by Hashem. And we don't recognize it, we cannot see it. We think that we're doing, we think that we're changing, that we have some power to affect things, to happen. No, I want to do this, I want to do that. Yashem Bashamayim Mishak Rama, Hashem sits in heaven and he's laughing, holding his stomach like that. Hashem is so powerful and so strong and we just don't understand what's going on in this world. But there is a plan. And I'll tell you what the plan is. The plan is to take all the arrogant people and to humiliate them and to take all of the humble ones and to uplift them, to bring them to a high place. That's the mission of Hashem. That's the will of Hashem. And for that, he built and created and planned and designed and prepared and did everything for that moment to come that all the arrogant people that think that they are better than someone else will go down and they will go down to a very low place. And all of the humble people that really feel in their heart that they are useless and that other people are better than them and that they have respect to other people and appreciation and gratitude to other people. Them, Hashem will choose them and will put them above His crown, in the peak of His crown, in the highest place of them all. That's the will of Hashem. So, when Hashem is humbling us, we need to accept it with love and to understand that that is the Godly plan, that that is the will of heaven, that that's the will of the Creator. When Hashem Barach is rising us and lifting us and carrying us to a high place, we also need to understand it and to appreciate it. And to let Hashem Barach do also amazing things with us. Because it's very ha easy for a person to go down. It's a natural reaction of a person that like emotionally he's closer to the sadness and the depression and the anger. Those are things that's very easy like, oh, I failed again. It's, you, you don't think, you just react like that. You, you, you slide on your old patterns and then going down, I failed again and it happened to me again. And all the memories are flashing back from the past again. Oh, another failure. And then you get used to that sadness and it becomes to be your condition. Yeah, me, I'm failure. Yeah, me, I'm down. Yeah, I'm low. I'm okay. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna make it. It's gonna be okay. And you lose your hope. And there could have been a good side to it if it would be real humili humility. If really it would come from a humble place. But the fact that it's coming from an arrogant place, a place that the person feels lack of satisfaction, that he's not happy with his condition, that he's frustrated, and that's why he wants to, to, to argue and to fight and to rebuke and to... So it shows that, shows that it's coming from a bad place. So that's why when Shem Bach is humbling us, we need to try to understand what his real will is and what's really is hiding in that situation and it's not hard to do it's really not hard to do if you want really to understand what Hashem Baruch is doing with you the main thing that you need to do is just to give some time to yourself to think it through to think about what you go through in life we must pause our life and just to stop and to observe and just to, to look inside and, and to think those are not spiritual talkings. Those are, 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 not, are, are not high wisdoms that, that, that... It's not Kabbalah, it's not secrets, it's just it's Pshat. You need to stop your car in the side of the road and to think about what had just happened. 
on, on that conversation that just happened, took place. Just you need to go to the porch and to close the door behind you and to spend 15 minutes alone with yourself, with Hashem. And just really to put your mind into really what just happened. What just happened right now? A friend came to me and told me a crazy story. He found himself fighting with his girlfriend and don't know what to do and she was calling him and he went out of a meeting and a big mess and nothing happened but everything exploded. Like nothing in the world happened. Like okay, so he was late in five minutes and she waited five minutes but the, the, the situation became like, like a flaming fire that burned everything. And, She's blessing him with all good, and he's blessing her, and like the worst that could have happened, happened. And I'm looking at him and I'm asking him, okay, but why are you taking yourself to those places? Why every time? Yeah, I cannot let no one talk to me like that. She's not going to tell me, and he's fighting. Okay, so are you happy? Okay, you broke up with her. That's it. You're not, now you're happy. No, she was so good, she was so nice, she was so fun. Okay, so if she was so good, so why, why are you justifying yourself and, and pushing yourself to go against your own will? You didn't want to break up with her, and now you were happy that you were together, and now she did something that upset you. Okay, so she pushed your buttons. Great, okay, but now, bottom line, you're not happy from the, the, that condition. You're not satisfied, so change it. No. Now he's got the pride, and he cannot apologize, and he cannot say sorry, and he cannot call her back, and, and it's not the first time. And it, why? Why are you destroying yourself? And the reason is only because you're not thinking enough. That's the only reason. Because you're not thinking about who you are, and why it's happening to you, and why really you reacted like you reacted. It's not... It's so easy to blame. No, she was telling me. Okay, she was telling you, but if she would tell me, I wouldn't get so angry. She said it to you and you explode. Okay, so why those words are exploding you? Why certain issues, certain subjects in life are destroying you? Are humiliating you, breaking your self-esteem, pushing you to such crazy corners and stress in life? You feel like you're... And on the edge, on the cliff, about to, to die. Okay, why? Really, you're not going to die. So she told you why you're always late. So she told you you're lazy. Okay, so she told you that she hates. Okay, so what? It's not a reason to destroy your own life with your bare hands because she tell, told you that you're lazy. But why you do it? Because in the end you do. You fight. You fight all the way. You're arguing. You're attacking. You're insulting. You're destroying someone that loves you. But why? If you're going to go back to your old memories and going to try to remind yourself where in situations in my past, where it all started, what exactly is that pattern, what is that situation that I'm so terrified of, what is really scaring me, what is that threat that is destroying me from inside, what brings me to that anxieties, to those crazy fears. A student of mine called me. I don't know what to do. I'm getting panic attacks. I'm so scared. Okay, from what you're scared of, I don't know. I don't. You do know. You just rather not to talk about it, or you feel ashamed to uh, to but to express, to sh to share, to say, to explain what some nonsense can put you in craziness. Oh, so you missed the turn. Okay, so you 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 you, you miss the 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 the. the, the the right turning. So what happened? So it's going to take you another four minutes. Those four minutes are not worth the stress that you're getting into because of missing that turn. Nothing happened. And if someone told you to take the wrong turn and that made you crazy, so you're going to explode on him and it's not worth it. So why we are reacting automatically like that? Why we're not who that we are? Why we're not controlling our own horses, ourselves? Because we're not thinking about things in depth. We're not going to make a real deep investigation and understand, okay, what, okay, I'm sick in my mind. I'm losing control on, over nothing. Okay, so I lost my way, so I can find it. If I'm just going to 
relax myself, I'm gonna stop the vehicle on the side of the way, I'm gonna call someone, I'm gonna check again on the ways, I'm gonna reroute myself, I'm gonna try to put the address again. You have solutions today. You can call someone, you can ask, you can stop a vehicle, you can ask a person. You're gonna lose your mind and not gonna heal yourself. You're not gonna help yourself and you're gonna destroy relationships and families and houses are being break because of nonsense. Because of nothing. Because he's got that crazy desire and she's got that crazy stress and she's crazy about money and he's crazy about himself and okay and now the house will go in flames of fire and the kids will go to the streets and no education and everything that you built and you invested so much and the wedding cost you so much you had to sell your golden uh, Swiss watch and now you're gonna break it all and so on. Why not to take those 10-15 minutes and to take yourself seriously and to have deep conversations with yourself and to put a mirror in front of your face and re deal with reality. And if you don't remember and your mind is weak, so write it down. Why am I getting into panic because of A, because of B, because of C? And now, second part, start answer your own questions because that I don't want no one to boss me around. Okay, what's the problem if someone tells you what to do? Now answer! It reminds me of my mother. Oh, okay. Okay, got the message. Okay, great. So what's the problem with your mother? Oh, what's the problem with your mother? Now one page is not enough. That, yeah, that's the way I'm guiding you to do one hour in Bodhidut. I'm starting with 10 minutes and then I'm bringing your mother to the picture and then it will become an hour. When you're gonna start talking about your father, you're gonna go in the six. It's a way, it's a way that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing my students to do it, but they do it. Okay, you start with yourself 10 minutes. You bring your mother, it's one hour, with your father, six hours, and you're righteous. When you complete doing tshuva and everything, you're gonna come back to who that you are. You're free to go. You can go the six hours, you're calm, you're happy, you relax. When we're making those investigations, it's like to go with a flashlight, with buckets of water, with a water pipe, down to the sewer, and to deal with all of the plumbing problems, with all of the waste, with all of the filth, with all of the stink, with all of the stuck things in our own system, and just to let them go. And if you're not going to do that once and for all, it's going to stuck there forever. And it's going to pile, and it's going to stink, and it's going to be dangerous in the end. You don't know when it can explode and what will be the damage. And you need to fix as much as you can. And every day you must throw the garbage and also to do something else. Every day, like in the house, you throw the garbage, you wash the dishes, you have certain things that you do daily, and you have things that you do weekly, and you have things that you do monthly, and you have things that you do only for Pesach. Okay, great. That's the way to do it. Also inside. Every day you need to throw the garbage. Every day you need to wash your tools, all your vessels, all your dishes. You need to clean yourself. And then once in a while, you have a little bit more time, you need to fix something. You need to go. You had a crazy situation. Someone was screaming at you and you lost your mind and all the monkeys jumped off your head. Okay, great. No problem. So now let's bring them home, bring those monkeys, check which monkeys jumped, why they jumped, what happened, what that poor guy told me, why I was exploding on him, what's the reason, what was so annoying, why I lost my mind because of that tiny thing that he said, what that tiny thing reminds me of. In the end you're going to realize that you just hate yourself, that you have problems with yourself. Your children, they're reminding you of yourself. Your wife, she's rebuking you and she's showing to you your own lackings. Your mother, she was showing their father. All of those mirrors, all of those people that are coming to you in your life are just showing to you what you need to fix. And the problem is that we don't want to do that. That we don't want to go into those embarrassing places, into those emotional, painful, sensitive, fragile places in our own souls, in our own spirits, in our own emo emotional bodies, in the memories that we have from the past. But, 
And listen to that because it's super important. As long as you live in your past, as long as you are reacting and attacking based on your patterns, based on your old memories, you don't live your life with Hashem. Because Hashem, He is with you right now in the present. He's not with you in the past. The past is your own memories. Your past is a, a, a piece of imagination. It's a story that you're making up over and over and, 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 and putting it again and again. And every time you twist some parts of it and you forget some other parts and you make combinations, it's not reality. Your past is not the truth. Your past is not something that you're really connected to. It's an illusion that you have. Those are flashbacks from the past. Those are pictures that you make albums from them. It's not reality. It's a fake reality of who that I am based on my past. No, who that you are is who that you are right now in the present. If you want to live with Hashem, you need to live the reality. You cannot live with Hashem in the past. It's not exist. To live with Hashem, you need to live with Hashem in the present because Hashem Barach is with you and He's the God of truth. I'll give you an, ex an example for that. For an example, a person now walks in the middle of the night in the street and he sees a person walk in front of him. Now he will be terrified. He thinks to himself, oh, maybe it's a robber, maybe someone that wants to hurt me, to attack me. Who knows who that person is? He can, I don't know. what. Okay, all those fake imagination. Why fake? Maybe he is a murderer. The reality is that you now came with that thought, not because that, that person is a murderer, just only because that you heard something in the news, because you saw some horror movie, because you heard that something happened to some person in a dark alley, and you're terrified from a story. You're terrified from your own fears, and that person might be your best friend. You don't know, you cannot see him yet, he is still very far from you. It can be a person that now feels the same fear from you as similar to the fear that you are afraid from him. And he can be your best friend. And if you will, and him will go together, that's it, you're not afraid anymore. But you're now going to be under that pressure and stress and you're hallucinating, you're just dreaming. You don't, you're not connected to reality. Why? Because you based your life on the past, on your emotional memories. So where are you holding? In a dream. You're not connected to reality. You're not with Hashem. You're lying to yourself. You're making up stories. You live in illusions that you have enemies, that things can happen to you, that there are rabbis, that there are people, that there are things, that this is my wife and my children. There is nothing. There is only Hashem. Now live your present with Hashem and you're protected. No one can touch you now. When you are with Hashem, no one can touch you. When someone can touch you, when you don't have Hashem with you, when you don't have Hashem with you, when you're lying to yourself and you're blaming other people. No, she told me. Okay, what she told you? That you're lazy? But deal with it. You are lazy. You know that you're lazy. What's the problem? You are lazy. You don't want to deal with it. But you need to deal with it. Because if Hashem wouldn't think that you really need to deal with it, He wouldn't wake up your wife to tell you that you're lazy. He wouldn't bring that person to talk about you behind your back. He wouldn't bring that story to... You need to work on yourself. You need to breathe. You need to bring back Hashem into your life. To the past? No. To the present. Hashem is God of truth. You want to be connected to Him, you must connect yourself to reality, to the truth. People are afraid and not asking for a raise and not asking, trying to get to, to improve and to go further in their job and to succeed. And why? Because they're afraid to be rejected. And they're not going to go to Shiduchim because they're afraid to be rejected. And they're not going to go and offer themselves for a very good job because they're afraid for rejection. And they're not going to go and rent a bigger house because they're afraid for rejection. And they will, and more and more, not going to talk to their children, not going to talk to their wives, not going to build relationships because they're afraid of rejection. But in reality, 
It might be that those people that are in front of you, they're full of appreciation to you. And they're just waiting for someone to take that job, to take that position, to give them that opportunity. To Maybe he just got that phone call that told him that he can now appoint someone from the office to take that job. And you don't know. But you destroyed it for yourself because you are basing your assumptions on your past. On your emotional pain from the past. And not on reality. In reality, you can just go knock on his door and tell him, Hi, Shalom Aleichem, how are you? I wanted to ask you a question. Is it an option that I'm going to take that job? I think I can do it in the best way in the world. Maximum, he's going to tell you no. And if he's going to tell you no, you go back to the same position. Nothing changed. So why are you not doing it? Because you're afraid of that humiliation. It's not a humiliation to hear no. So why are you so afraid? Because you are putting your mind into the emotional pain from the past, from five years ago, from seven years ago, from 10 years ago, from 20, 30 years ago, and you let your automatic pilot drive your life, drive you further and further into hell, into the sorrow, into the failures of your life into that feeling of despair, of sadness, of being lonely and depressed and sad and lack of abilities and, and worthless and hopeless and, and, and why? Because you choose, like a little child, not to deal with reality and not to take yourself to treatment and to treat yourself and to go and have an honest conversation with yourself with Hashem. You don't need more than that. And that therapist will cost you nothing. It's going to save you so much money, you crazy brothers. You must listen. I'm trying to help you guys. If you will just use the tools that Hashem gave you, you're going to heal your own spirit much, much more than another person that want to take money from you. Why? Because he's bribed, because he wants money. So he cannot see the complete picture. It's very comfortable for him to talk to you in the next session. So he will not gonna solve the problems with you today. It's a problem. Not all the therapists are like that. There are people that already made so many millions of dollars that they, it's okay, they can finish with you in one meeting. So it's good. Sometimes it's good to go to a therapist, but not always. You need to check with yourself. Is it really the way for me to go? Maybe I can help myself. Maybe I can ease my own pain, my own sorrow. Maybe there are things that I can solve on my own, by myself. And the truth is that 99.9, .9, and Hashem will help us to achieve 100% of what it we can solve, we can do it on our own. It's not a problem. Because God gave us the tools to make those deep investigations inside of our own spirits. And the way to do it is just to check what the truth is and what is a lie. Where am I lying to myself and where I am saying the truth? And you can claim to say the truth and to lie to yourself for the rest of your life. Many people are doing it, claiming to hold the truth and the divine truth and the real truth the and idolizing themselves and telling everyone how great they are and how important they are and how amazing they are and going and, and, and yapping and, 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 and confusing other people to follow their pride, their arrogance, their, their imagination of, of having some existence in this world. But when you are trying really to investigate and to find the truth. Divrei emet nikarim, words of truth will be recognized. If you're going to ask yourself the real questions, you're going to find the real answers to those questions. But if your purpose, if your reason for that conversation, for that decision, for that decision that you took to come and to have that conversation with yourself came from a selfish place, from a lazy place, from a place of sadness, from a place that tried to exempt himself from responsibility, and you just want to reject all of the, of the, of the emotional sorrow, and you don't want to feel the pain, so you're not going to find the real answer in the end. 
he, a lot of people can go to the fields and do an Arid Bodadut and to come back from the field like the, same, like the same person that they came. I remember a conversation with a friend of mine maybe 15, maybe 12 years ago and that person asked me, I cannot understand how can it be that I'm going every day and doing one hour in Bodadut in the field talking to Hashem every day for an hour. And he said, I'm not changing. Nothing is changing me. So I told him, it depends on your point of truth in the field. And thank God I was able to tell him that 15 years ago already. Because I realized those things on myself, on my own flesh. If you go just because you want to run away from your wife, and that's why you go to do it but the dude, you're not going to achieve anything. If you want to go to the field because you want to become holy, you want everyone to think that you're holy, I don't know what, you're not going to achieve anything. But if you go to the field because you feel ashamed, because you feel a disgrace, because you want to do tshuva, because you want to clean yourself, because you cannot stand your behavior, because you cannot stand yourself failing again and again, over and over, in the same situations, and that's how you go, and that's your approach, and that's how you go and confess, and talk, and cry, and beg to Hashem, you're a different person. You've already been changed. You don't need to do six hours to be changed. You're already a different person just by going with that intention. That intention is purifying you. That's it. You're a different person. Who is purifying us? Father in heaven. Oh, wait a minute. The mikveh is purifying the impure people, right? But Hashem... Metaeret Israel, but Hashem is purifying Am Israel. Okay, the mikveh is purifying the Tmeim, the people that are impure. But Hashem is purifying Am Israel. What, what does it mean? That when you're impure, when your mind is not connected to Hashem, you always feel you need mikveh, you need mentorah, you need to do mitzvot, you need to go to shul, because you're Tameh. So you need a mikveh. But when you're in the aspect of Israel, so Hashem is purifying you. Hashem is cleaning you. You don't need anything. You have Hashem. There was a big Admor, a big Rebbe, that before of the Holy Day, he, was, he had that custom, that minhag, that he was blessing Am Israel. All of his students would come to him and would ask for blessings, and he would bless everyone, one after the other. And then, in one of the Holy Days, he found himself that it was already late, and they had to start Mincha, and he didn't go to Mikveh in that day. So people start saying, okay, what are we going to do? Maybe there is a Mikveh, and everyone with the Hishtadluyot, all of that Haredi effort, sweating, what are we going to do? We must find a Mikveh for the Rav, a Rav, we need a Mikveh, we need a Mikveh. Okay, relax. What the Rebbe said? The Rebbe said, guys, everyone, Put your hands all together like that. Make a huge circle. Come on, everyone, all of the people. Put your hands, put your hands. And everyone putting their hands, don't know what to do, if to do, what to do. The Rebbe said, okay, everyone putting their hands. And he, what he did, he started running between them and he let their hands hitting him. And he's asking them, and, and he's asking them, put your hands, put your hands. And he's running between them and, and touching everyone and, and everyone are touching him. And then they asked him, Rav, what are you doing? What happened to you? I lost his mind. You don't know. We didn't go to Mikveh. He lost his mind. <laughs> the Rav told them, Mikveh Yisrael Hashem Moshi'o Be'et Sarah. The Mikveh is Am Yisrael. Am Yisrael are equal to Mikveh. Mikveh Yisrael. Mikveh and Yisrael, it's the same thing. When he went between his people, he been purified like Mikveh. Why? Because the verse said, Mikveh Israel, Hashem, Hashem is the one that's going to purify us. He's going to save us from the trouble. So he had the trouble. He needed Mikveh. He had Am Israel. That's it. It's a wrap. You just need to go. Touch me. That's it. And it's finished. And it's done. And that Rabbi, he was purer than all of those ones that went 610 Tvilot, you must go, all of the crazy people in the Mikveh. What's that? Can you explain to me that thing in the Mikveh? Ay, Bono Shel Olam, the sickness of this generation. I want to understand that. 
What in the world you think to yourself that you go to the mikveh, you go under the water, you take your hand out and you're splashing water. What do you think that you're doing? You think that it's purifying you? You think that it calls mikveh? Mikveh is when you go to the mikveh and you humble yourself under the water. You can do it once, you can do it twice. You think that by hitting the water in and out, you take your hand into the water, out from the water 700 times. What do you th where do you think you are? Who are you serving? A computer? A teacher? Who? The Creator? You know who is He? He's the source of mercy. He's the, the peak of wisdom. He's the highest intelligence in the, in beyond the creation. You think that by acting crazy you're going to achieve things with Hashem? People going with their eyes like that in the streets. No, I'm not looking at women. And he's not talking with his wife and he doesn't have peace in his house and he thinks that he's holy. You think that in the world you can have a blessing of holiness, of purity, when you don't have peace with your wife? It's the beginning. It's the beginning, that's the foundation. Lo matza kadosh baruch hu kli machzik bracha ela hashalom. The peace in the house, that's the only vessel that God found to bless you with. And if you don't have that, so... Oh no, but I was hitting the water today 310 times. You don't know. Every morning I do that. You're crazy. Your wife can't stand you. No one cares that you go early. They're very happy that you left the house. Now they're going to have a nice morning. Oh, please, thank God, Father in heaven, that my husband went to pray in the minyan. Please let him have a good prayer that he's going to go and, and, and be inspired, going to pray for two hours. And after he please, that he's going to succeed in the limud, that he's going to learn another 40 pages. Please. Keep him out of the house until supper. Please, Ribbono Shalolam, let him have a fantastic day that he will be so satisfied. He won't have no troubles that he's not going to come and spill all of his filth on me. I don't want to hear on his troubles anymore. Please, Hashem, make him succeed. Go on his own way. As less hours as I can see him, please, in the house, have mercy on me, Ribbono Shalolam. And her prayers are being accepted. And that's it. And Hashem accepts our prayers. And you think that you're such Avrech, Silk Avrech, Avrech Meshi, everyone, a genius, the Gaon, a Gadol, a Kadosh, a Gibor, a Nora, and everyone are just full of nonsense. I'm watching my mouth. I, I were in the synagogue. I'm trying at least. People are bent and twisted and evil and, and selfish and disgusting and cruel. And they're holding themselves like this control the universe, the defenders of the crown, going, learning Gemara and Chumash and Mishnah. What's that? You want to learn Torah? You know what it means to learn Torah? To learn Torah, it means that you feel that you just received the Torah like in Mount Sinai, that you're humble, that you have Abad Israel, that you are united with all of your nation as one person with one heart. That's what it means to learn Torah. If you learn Torah in a different way, that you're hitting your chavruta, your partner, and you're arguing with him, and you're showing to him your wisdom, that's Torah? That's not Torah! That's the wisdom of the devil to divide between people, to make arguments, to make separations. No, oh, I prepared the class. I prepared. I learned. How many times you finished that Masechta? How many times you finished that page? And you're just making yourself arrogant and proud of yourself and full of yourself and just full of imaginations. You're trying to show people your greatness instead of reminding yourself how low you are in front of Hashem. And being humble. Rabbi Nachman of Reslev is saying, if a person wants to be righteous, he needs to do two things in Likutei Moran. One is he needs to be Magbi Ashfalim. He needs to rise all the weak people, all the poor people to bring them up. And he needs to be Mashpil Geim. And he also needs to take all the arrogant people and to bring them down. He needs to destroy them. And Rabbi Nachman is saying that if the person is not doing both of those things, Ein Shem Tzadik Chal Alav Klal. The name righteous is not one of his names at all. You cannot call that person righteous. So now, let's ima imagine to ourselves 
that you have a person that all day long he's supporting people. He gives money to the poor. He's sitting for hours and hours with the weak people, with the ones that don't know how to learn. And he's sitting with them 10 hours every day and giving to them and loving them and supporting them. But when he sees an arrogant person, he is not exploding his balloon. He's not waking him up to realize that he's a zero. He just let him continue with his pride. So that person that we just described is not righteous at all, Rabbi Nachman of Breslev is saying. Okay, so now you don't need to be worried because Rabbi Nachman can say whatever and you don't need to follow and everything is perfect. But if you follow Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, so Rabbi Nachman of Breslev said that you are not righteous at all until you're going to start fighting with the evil. Until you're not going to start stand up for the weak and going to fight for them. Not only show your compassion and your greatness and receive a lot of honor from them and a lot of respect from them and appreciation from them and gratitude for them. Not only that. That's nice. That's half. But you have another half. What's the other half? That you need to fight. That you need to dare to confront the powerful, evil people of this generation, the ones that take control and possession and, and overpowering themselves and forcing people to bend to them and to follow them and to do whatever they're going to force them to do and forcing them to take the money from them and to destroy their families. And you need to fight against that evil. You have to fight against that dark power that lives, that runs in the world. And if you don't do that, you're not righteous. Righteous is a person that is ready to die for Hashem in every moment of his life. Not only to give all of his money to charity. Also to force other people to give. And also to convince other people and to stop other people from giving if by giving they're going to make some damage. To go and to protect the widows. To go and to protect all of the women that their husbands are refusing to give them a get. Also to save all of the women that have been hurt by their husbands or by other men. Also to protect all of the children that are learning in schools and in religious and school systems that are being molested and destroyed by the rabbis and the teachers over there. And you, no, I don't want to talk. It's a community. The rabbi, if the rabbi is not talking, so who am I to talk? Maybe you're better than him. Maybe that's the evidence that he needs to give his chair back, that he needs to give his crown back. The rabbi is not talking, so who should talk? If the rabbi is not talking, it's time to change the rabbi. And if there is no rabbi, so you should be the rabbi. If you have the courage to go and to speak and to talk, so maybe you need to be the rabbi. Now you're going to break and destroy yourself with your low self-esteem. No, I was not learning enough. I was not doing enough. You don't need to do. You need to fight. You need to go and do your job. You need to go and help the weak. You need to go and save lives of people. You need to go and support the poor. You need to go and fight with those people that are destroying other people. You need to use the tools and the power that Hashem Barach gave you and you're not exempt from that and nothing that you will do will exempt you from that. The fact that you're learning eight hours of Torah every day in Beit Midrash not exempting you from fighting for the poor. It's better that you're all day long going to fight for the poor and not going to learn Torah. It's much better. Because here you're saving lives of people. Because here you're saving lives of people. Because here you have poor people that you're not allowed to ignore their sorrow. And they're crying. And they're being destroyed. And it's all happening under your nose. And you're not allowed to ignore. You're not allowed to ignore. Yes, you're not allowed to ignore. And if you find yourself reason why to ignore, no, but look, who am I? What can I do? Okay, so you're just you're not righteous. You're not pure. You're impure. And also you accept it. Okay, so it means that you decreed on yourself to stay like that for good. Okay, that's me. What can I do? You choose. You choose to be medium. You choose to be low. You choose. You choose to act. I'm innocent, I'm tamim, I'm simple, no, I'm minding my own business. Uh, but I'm going to ask you, hey, you have blood on your hands. 
You heard that woman screaming. You heard that husband throwing things in the house. You heard those children running out from the house in screamings. But you were witnessing those things in life. You were there. You heard the door slamming. You, you, you were there. You, you're part of it. Hashem put you part of it. Hashem forced you to be part of that situation. So now what are you going to do about that? No, oh, I'm minding my own business. No problem. When you're going to say, Hashem, but I cannot pay my rent, Hashem is going to tell you, I'm sorry, I'm minding my own business. I'm, I'm I know, okay. You know, find your own money, and I'm minding my own business. That's exactly what will happen with that person. You close your eyes from looking at the poor and the weak and the orphans and the widows and the converts and all of the Baalei Tshuva and all of the people that are poor from even knowing how to reach out and to ask for help and you minding your own business. No, look, I have my own family, I have my own business, I have my own things I need to take care of. No problem. But when you're going to need some help, what are you going to do then? I have students that I, I'm trying, I'm calling them students, but they're not coming to my classes, so it's kind of hard to call them students. But I have those students that I'm trying to call them students and really to make them students. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to move a finger for their own success. For yourself you don't want to do, so how can someone help you? You think that we're magicians, I'm going to come, I'm going to heal your house, I'm going to whisper some verses in, in your dark corners of your house. I'm not a wizard. I'm not a black magician. We're praying to Hashem, and if you have the merit, the prayer will be answered. And if you don't have the merit, the prayer won't be answered. I have people that I prayed for them for hours, and it didn't help. Why? Because they're not worthy to be answered. It's not my fault. You think that I'm not righteous? I am. I am. The verse is saying, All of the nation, they're all righteous. Why you don't think that you're righteous? Why it's easier for you to believe that I'm righteous and it's harder for you to believe that you're righteous? Because you never investigated to find who you really are inside. You don't know how righteous you are. That's your problem. You're not aware to your true self to find out how amazing and inspiring creation you are. But Hashem, He sees that. And that's why Hashem still got hope from you. And that's why every morning He's waking you up and keep on sending messages to you. And WhatsApps and short clips and, 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 and voice notes and... and uh, Notifications on, on, on Facebook, right? Notifications, you call that. And yes, Hashem is calling you. Why? Because Hashem still got hope from you. So He's waking you up again and again, again and again. And to do what? To do what? I'm, 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 I'm so embarrassed, really. I'm a much, I want to help you guys, but I don't, I don't find a way. Today, we drove in some Frum area <sighs> and someone told me this is a Hasidic area. He said this is a Hasidic area. Okay, Hasidic area. Let's see the Hasidut of this place. I couldn't find any, 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 any good point <coughs> in that place, except of the grass, the trees, the squirrels, things that were there before that the Hasidim came. I'm sorry. What does it mean to be a Hasid? That you are part of a community that calls themselves Hasidut? That's what it means to be Hasid? You think that now if people are calling you Hasid Satmer, Hasid Bels, Hasid Breslev, Hasid Chabad, so that makes you a Hasid? If you have that silly jacket like I wear, you think that makes you Hasid? If you have a longer beard than mine, it makes you Hasid? What's that? that those are hair. It's nothing. It's nothing. There was a Chacham, a wise person in the time of the Gemara, that someone came to him and told him, Oh, you have such a nice beard. He said, Give me the scissors. That's, that was his reaction. Give me the scissors. What's that? This piece of junk. What's that? 
It's not that it's hair, it's growing by itself. Do you think that you have some intention with having your beard, your chassid, you have a beard? You just didn't shave it, that's it, that's what you did. What is it, the jacket, the jacket? Okay, what is that jacket? That makes you chassid? That makes you a Jew? Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, the grand, great-grandson of Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, he once asked Rabbi Nathan of Breslev, how you become a Jew? Ech niya, ech anizke, ech, how I'm going to become a Jew? Rabbi Nathan almost fainted. He didn't know what to do with himself. The Admor, Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, is asking how I'm going to become a Jew. And what was his answer? On his book, the book that he wrote, that he was collecting from all of the Gemarot, from all of the Mishnayot, from all of the Midrashim, all of the verses, all of the parts, all of the lines that were talking about way of the land, about manners, about Midot, and he called that book Sefer HaMidot, the book of attributes of how to behave, and he said, that book made me a Jew. What it means? The fact that I was searching for the right way how to behave through all of the books. And I took it out and I wrote those notes for myself and I was working on how to get rid of anger, on how to get rid of sadness, on how to get rid of, of, of all lusts and desires, how to be generous, how to be kind. That made me a Jew. He's going to a store and buying in 1999 a black long jacket and he calls himself Hasid. What's that? It's nothing. Here comes the man in black. It's Stuyot, it's nonsense. Man in black. Will Smith can make it much better than you. Nonsense, who are you? Who do you think you are? Hasid. The Gemara is asking, can you imagine to yourself that David, King David, will call himself Hasid? For the Gemara, it was impossible to believe that King David will call himself Hasid. But today, I'm Hasid Breslev, I'm Hasid Chabad, I'm Hasid Bells, I'm Hasid Vizhnitz, I'm Hasid, Hasid, Hasid. No, I'm Haaretz, Hasid. No, you're I'm Haaretz. You're ignorant. You're not Hasid. You're not Hasid. Maybe Hasidah. How is it Hasidah? You don't know why I say Hasidah? Ostrich. Ostrich. Maybe you're an ostrich. The ostrich Rebbe is his rabbi. Nonsense! Shtuyot! Shtuyot! You want to know what Hashem wants? You want really to know? I'll tell you what Hashem wants. Hashem wants you to be happy. Hashem wants every creation to be happy. Hashem wants all of His creations to be healthy and happy and with no sorrow and no pain in their life. That's what Hashem wants. Hashem wants all of the non-Jews that lives in India, they call over there Hindus. Hindus, He wants them all to be happy. Hashem wants also all of the Jewish to be happy. Hashem wants all the Muslims to be happy. All the Christians to be happy. All the, oh, everyone. He wants the bears to be happy. He wants the tigers, the leopards, the cheetahs, the, the squirrels, the, the, the bunny rabbits, the, the, the tiny ants. You, you have more ants in the world than human beings. Maybe 20 times more than human beings. Maybe 200 times more ants than people. And you think that you're, the reality, that you're the center of the universe. If you think that you are better than one person, than one animal that Hashem made, so you are stupid as hell and you cannot call yourself Hasid for good, forever. you the dumbest person I ever met in my life. I'm sorry. If you think that you are better than a cockroach, so you're stupid. You're dumb. You're messed up. You're all twisted. When David Melech came once to Hashem Barach and asked him, he didn't say, he asked, do you have a creation that prays you more than me? He asked. Because he checked himself and he saw that this guy is praising Hashem Barach day and night. So he asked Hashem, do you have someone that is praising you more than me? 
Hashem took him to the side, to the swamps, and showed him a frog. And he told him, that frog is praising me with 1,000 voices every time it opens his mouth. So who are you to compare yourself to that frog? He said to King David that wrote the book of Tehillim. And you that don't even know the number of your shoes every time you need to call your wife and to ask her, what should I do? What should I bite? Not to bite? What should I do? And you, you don't know yourself. You don't know the size of your pants. What's your number? I need to check. <laughs> Morons! Twisted! Ignorant people! But, Hasid, oh, nice long jacket, sweat all day long. What are you doing? Why are you calling yourself Hasid? Why do you really think that you're Hasid? How, you, how in the world you came to that understanding that you were really Hasid? To call yourself Hasid? You want to hide from the world, you don't want to deal. Okay, say some truth, I'll hear you. I'll hear you. We're gonna hug you, we're gonna love you, we're gonna hear your thing, we're gonna help you. It's great. You can choose to live in a from area. I want to live in a from area. Great, no problem. Say that. Say I don't want to, I, I feel more protected here, I feel better here, it's a good environment for me. Okay, let's say it right. If you're not lying, so we're going to agree with you. It's okay. But say the truth. That's the best area in the world. Okay, now I got it. Go tell a, a person from Brooklyn that there is a better place than Brooklyn. He won't hear you. Why? Brooklyn. You don't know what you're talking about. Great. Okay, go. Talk to someone from Woodmere, from Five Towns. Tell him there is a better place. Maybe we'll go to, to Brooklyn. Come on. You can compare Brooklyn to Woodmere. What are you talking about? Okay, you know what? Go ask someone else. Someone that lives in Monsi. Tell him, oh, come on. Let's move. Move to Woodmere. Monsi, that's another place. It's a different league. In Monsi. And you're going to start talking about Monsi. Why? Go talk to a Chabadnik about, uh, tell him about Breslev. Yeah, Breslev, it's also good, but look, Chabad, that Morazaken, you don't know, you cannot understand. And do the opposite. Go talk to a Hasid Breslev about Chabad. He will tell you, yes, Chabad, it's good, everything is good. But Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, the righteous man of the generation, and they're all just full of imaginations. They're not really connected to reality. Do you really investigate it on Chabad that you're now going to go and say that you know that Breslev is better? Do you really investigate it on Breslev to know what Breslev means? You call yourself Hasid, Vishni. Do you know what it means to be Hasid that you call yourself Hasid? Do you really know who was the the Vizhnitzer of? Do you know who was really, how really that wisdom came to this generation that now you have this Hasidut? Do you understand what you're talking about? The answer is no. The answer is that you don't have a clue about anything. And if you really want to find the truth, you need to go and make an investigation. First of all, start with yourself. Who am I? And what am I doing? And why am I doing it? Who is my wife? Who are my children? What are we doing in this world? What is our mission? A person came to me a few weeks ago and tells me I was learning Torah. I was so happy for two years and then in one day I, I cannot learn anymore. I don't have the power to learn. I told him, okay, so maybe now it's a different stage in your life. Maybe it will, you know, work a little bit and maybe one day you will be able to come back and learn a little bit more. He told me, but isn't it truth that the purpose is really to learn all day long, that every person needs to learn in Beit Midrash all day long? I told him that is what that your Rebbe told you. That's not your own understanding. Your teacher told you that you need all day long to be in Beit Midrash. Did you check that? Did you ask yourself if it's the truth or not? Maybe it's not the truth for you. Maybe it's not the truth for your wife. Maybe it's not the truth in your economic situation. 
Maybe you need to work and to support your own family. Maybe it's not so good for you to spend 8 or 12 hours every day in the Beit Midrash. Maybe. But until you're going to make that own investigation, checking yourself, okay, what happened when I went to 12 hours to Beit Midrash? And what happened when I was working half day and half day learning? And what happened when I was only learning? And what was my wife saying? And what was I feeling? And what happened? And what were the results? If you haven't made that investigation, I'm sorry, you're not going to find the answer. The answer is coming only after you ask the question. And if you don't dare to ask the deepest questions about who that you are, you will never going to find who that you are. You will never going to know who you are. And you're just going to go blind and, 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 and limited without knowing who you are. And you can burn 120 years in this world without knowing who you are and what your purpose. What is your purpose? But if you will find out who you really are, you will be fantastic. And you can be a very simple pre person, just righteous. There was a hidden righteous man that he was a shoemaker. There was a hidden righteous man, one of the 36 hidden righteous people in that generation, that he was a builder. Rabbi Yudazev Lebovich, he was a road, measuring roads for the, for the city hall of Tel Aviv. Yafo. He was waking up in the morning and measuring the streets to see where to put the, 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 the cement, how to, how to make the streets straight and balanced. That was his job. And it's Rabbi Yudazev Levovich. You know who Rabbi Yudazev Levovich was? No, we don't know. We cannot understand. But we know that he said once on himself that even angels were terrified from him. We're talking about the person that the Rab, Rab Aaron of Bells was praising him and saying on him things that it was scary. And Rab Aaron of Bells, they said that he was like Rabbi Aaron, like Aaron Cohen. We're talking about huge giants. And he was waking up in the morning and measuring the streets and working for the city hall. And what he was doing with the money, you know what? He was buying food and feed the poor. And he would pay the rent more than how much that the landlord was asking from him because he realized that the land, landlord was in trouble, financial trouble. He paid him more than how much that he asked him. I saw that note that that landlord wrote to him. I had the married to look on many of his handwrites. And it was written over there, please, I'm asking you, please, Rabbi Yudazev Levovich, don't put more money than I asked you to put in the envelope. He was paying more for the rent because he cared about his landlord. And every Shabbat he would go, every Friday noon he would go and buy loaves of bread and he would give them to the poor. Every Shabbat he would go and buy 10 loaves of bread and he was going and giving them to the poor. And he was learning Kabbalah and he was righteous, but he was hidden. You would see him in the street, you would ignore him, you wouldn't care about him. Why? Because he wouldn't care about himself. He wouldn't go like that with all of the suits and the honor and like that and showing himself and... Do no! He was humble! And he was Rabbi Yudazev Lemovich. And he could work. So why did you not gonna work? No, I need to learn. You can do both. You don't want to do both. You want to run away from commitments. You want to hide yourself in a Beit Midrash with nice air condition all day long to hide over there that no one can complain on you, that no one will be able to tell you something wrong about you. You're just afraid to deal with your reality. That you need to support your family, that you need to bring money to the house, that you need to be nice to everyone, that you need to learn, that you need to learn how to behave, that you need to work on your attributes, that you need to be a better person. And you want to run from all of that. It's a very easy outlet to run on Hasid now. That's it. No one can talk to me. Nonsense. They're going to talk to you in Judgment Day. You think that Hashem is afraid of you? Because you lived in, 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 in Bora Park or in Flatbush or in Monsi? Who are you? Who do you think you are? You know what Hashem will do to you? You know what Hashem will do to you in Judgment Day? Ask me, 
I'm terrified. I'm terrified. From judgment day, I'm terrified. Hashem will open everything. Hashem not going to spare one thing. Hashem not going to let me hide one thing. So what I'm doing about this fear? I'm trying to expose everything that I can before of judgment day. I'm trying to clean my hands before of judgment day. I'm asking Hashem in Barach, okay, maybe I have something here, maybe something is wrong. I'm looking, I'm checking, maybe, maybe I was hiding here. Every day I'm searching, I'm checking what have I had, what have I done. Maybe yesterday, remind me yesterday, please do Every day, every day, now, my wife, she told me something. Okay, why, why my wife, she's suffering so much? What have I done? Maybe there is something that I can do to help her. No, she is nervous. Oh, no, she's just cranky. Oh, she is now the... No. Why? Wait, relax. Why you just reject the, the, the lesson? Maybe there is something. Listen. Open your ears. Open your heart. Listen to her voice. You need to listen to her voice. She's talking to you. Life is talking to you. Communicating with you. Telling you things. Sending a message, one wave after the other, one day after the next, every day another message, another message from heaven. Have you ever looked at Kriyat Shema to say Kriyat Shema? I cannot say Kriyat Shema without crying. Say Kriyat Shema, Ve'ahavta, you can, cannot continue. You should love Hashem, Ve'ahavta. What does it mean, Ve'ahavta? When you had a girlfriend when you were 16 and you loved her, all day long she was in your mind, you couldn't function, you couldn't move, where is she? That's what you do when you love. All day long in your mind, all day long. Kol hayom isichati. Ve'ahavta et Hashem elokecha. Et Hashem elokecha. Also when he's hardening you. Also when he's rebuking you. Also when he's limiting you. Also when he's holding you back. Also when he's not answering your prayers. Bechol evavcha, with all of your heart. Your heart, you know you have a heart. Do you know what it means to have a heart? What does it mean to have a heart? To have a heart, it means to feel. Okay, now I need to feel. What does it mean to feel? Sometimes I feel good, sometimes I feel bad. And I need to love Hashem in every feeling. So when I feel good, I need to love Hashem. And when I feel bad, I need to love Hashem. And when I feel loved, I need to love Hashem back. And when I feel rejected, to love Hashem because you need to love Hashem with all of your spirit what is my spirit are you aware to your spirit do you know what your spirit is no but you're commanded to love Hashem so you're commanded to know your your spirit what is your spirit can someone answer what is your spirit do you know what the spirit is so you're drinking Sprite you think it's gonna help you Spilt. It's not going to help you. You need to find out who am I? What is my emotional body? What is my physical body? Where my spirit starts? Where my spirit finished? Where my soul starts? What it means? With everything you have. What does it mean that I should love Hashem with everything I have? Now I have that book. How can I love Hashem with a book? I'm going to kiss the book. No, I, can, can love the, I, love, I love the book. I'm going to love Hashem with that book, that if someone came to your house and looked at your bookcase and said, wow, that's an amazing book, that you won't think twice, that you're going to give that book, that you're going to love Hashem. On Avraham Avinu, it's written, Avraham Avi, that Avraham, he was the one that loved me, and the interpretation of Avraham Ohavi was that Avraham was making other people to love Hashem. How you show your love to Hashem? By making other people love Hashem. So now, are you making other people love Hashem? Now, let's ask, does your wife love Hashem more because of you or less? Does your children love Hashem more because of you or less? Now your parents, they love Hashem more because of you or less? Now you love Hashem because of you more or less? Ask yourself, but you need to make people love Hashem. But you hate Hashem, and your wife, she hates you, and she hates Hashem. And your parents, they hate themselves, and they hate you, and they hate Hashem. And they hate life. And your children, they cannot find no outlet. Okay, so you destroyed more than you built. Okay, so now what you're going to do? Oh, 
I'm so depressed now, I don't know what to do now, I destroyed, I ruined. No, that arrogance, that is arrogance. You don't need to be so arrogant. Even if you ruined, even if you can be destroyed, you should believe that you can fix. So start fixing. What are you going to fix? Now you need to go and fix your relationship with your child. Okay, now you need to go and fix your relationship with your wife. Now you need to go and fix your relationship with your parents. But I cannot deal with all at once. Okay, so make one step every day. Make a notebook. Write for yourself a list of duties, of obligations. Your obligations, not the Ten Commandments. You're also not exempt from that. But Mizeo Mizeo Al Tanakh Yedcha. You have your own obligations that Hashem is commanding you and also the obligations of the Torah. And they're combining, they become one together. That's what it means, Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah, that you first of all need to work on yourself. And then you can go and keep Torah mitzvot. But just to act religious, to act frum, to act Hasidic, just act foolish. There's no connection to reality in your manners, in your behavior. You insult people, you hurt people. Everyone that ashamed, that insults someone else in public, he does not have a share in the world to come. Now what are you going to do with that? How can you deal with that? Rabim means to. In front of public means to. It was you, your friend, and another person, that's it. You're done. Now what are you going to do? You need to ask forgiveness until that person will forgive you. And if not, you're in a problem. You're in a situation. You don't have a solution. So what you're going to do now? Oh, so I'm done. So I'm finished. So I'm dead. Again, that despair. If that despair would come from humility, great. But it's coming from arrogance, from laziness, because you don't want to make that phone call and to apologize, right? But make that phone call and apologize. Tell him, I'm sorry. Tell him, please forgive me. I hurt your feelings. I'm apologizing. And if you don't have the heart to do that, so go and cry to Hashem. Tell Him, Hashem, I don't feel. I don't understand. I can't function. My heart is, is numbed. I can't feel with my heart. Basics of Judaism, it's to be a human being. It's to be sensitive. It's to care. It's to love. It's to respect your wife. It's to respect people. People that are going... Not to talk Lashonara. People are going and talking Lashonara. Amounts of Lashonara that people are going and destroying the world with their Lashonara. And they imagine to themselves that they're clean. Like they got some authority to talk Lashonara. They allow. They allow to judge. They allow to criticize. They allow to, to say their opinion. To, to, to close. To open. To decide. To, you're going to stand in front of Hashem in every situation. No one's going to exempt you from Judgment Day. What are you going to do? You're going to stand in front of Hashem and you're going to have to explain exactly how you made your investigation, how you built your court, who were the judges, how you came to that conclusion, if you heard the right testaments from people, if you investigated the witness properly, if you really checked every detail, if you checked your heart and you cleaned yourself to know that you're not bribed, that you're not maybe chas shalom involved in any way in that case. And if you have not done all of that and you made a decision and you took a side, <laughs> I'm not jealous at you. I don't know how you're going to protect yourself in Judgment Day. But I promise everyone that is finding himself in those places that he's going to be judged. He will be judged by his own actions, by his own, by his own soul. We're not allowed to do those things. We're not allowed to, uh, not allowed to allow ourselves to do those things. And also we're not allowed other people to allow other people to do those things. So if you see someone that is going and yapping and talking the Shonara, you need to close his mouth. And not to be afraid of him because he's strong, because he's powerful, because he's... Who is he? You know what Moshe Rabbeinu did to Pharaoh when he heard Pharaoh talking the Shonara? He slapped his face. Pharaoh! You know who Pharaoh was? Donald Trump is like the, the kinky, pinky toe of, 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 of Pharaoh in those days. Who is Donald Trump compared to, 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 
to Pharaoh. You know who was Pharaoh? Pharaoh was Moshe. Who was Moshe? Moshe was nothing. Moshe just came. It's the first prophecy of Moshe in Egypt. He's coming to meet Pharaoh first time. That that Jew is coming to speak with the king of the of 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 all that area, all of the the Middle East. The king he was destroying kingships. One nation after a nation would come to Egypt and they would take them in prison and take all their treasures and destroy them, making them slaves. And I don't know how many nations came under their hands. They destroyed each nation one after the other. He was so strong, so powerful. And Moshe Rabbeinu came and told him, let my people go. And Pharaoh is looking at him from the top floor of his stage, sitting in, on his throne of honor, all of his soldiers, all of the special forces, all of the black magicians, everyone of them. And that crazy punk Moshe is talking to him. Yes, that's reality. that was reality. Moshe had some yellow. No, he didn't have anything. That's what he felt, that's what he believed in. He believed in that. You should believe in that as well. Why do you think that Hashem is not backing you up? Because you don't have the understanding how much Hashem loves you. Moshe realized, Moshe remembered the miracles. Moshe saw the supervision. He didn't ignore it. And you ignore it. Every day you have wonders. Every day you see miracles. Every day you see your body is functioning. You have a pump in your heart, that, that, in your body, that works 24-7 for 80 years, for 90 years, 100 years, with no power source. Have you ever heard about an, 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 something like so crazy? A pump that works on its own with no battery? For years! The person that will make that pump will be the biggest, richest person in the world. Moshe Rabbeinu saw Pharaoh, the king of the world, is talking Lashon Ara on Hashem. He climbed those staircase and came and slapped him in his face until he fell on the floor. When, Moshe, when Abraham Avinu saw Nimrod, that Nimrod said the same thing about Hashem to Abraham Avinu, and Nimrod was even worse than Pharaoh. Nimrod was even worse than Pharaoh. We're talking about the earliest generations. He was so powerful, he was so strong. Abraham Avinu talked to him and he started cursing. Abraham Avinu went to him and slapped his face and again he fell on his face. And he screamed. And, and, and everyone were, were, were fainting, falling on the floor, couldn't move. And everyone thought that it's the voice of Hashem that they heard from that scream of Abraham Avinu. So they called him, they said, please talk to us, don't let Hashem talk to us, we're afraid from his voice. He said, it was me. I'm the lowest creation of Hashem, and you're terrified for me. And you never heard Hashem speaks. People that are still afraid of people, they don't have no understanding of this world at all. People that have opinion on people, they don't have no understanding on this world at all. He's talking to you and he really talks to you? That person is, is just, he lives in a dream. If when that person is talking to you, he is really thinking that he's talking to you, you just need to have mercy on him. You just need to love him. If when a person is talking to you, he really thinks that he is talking to you right now, he just needs to be loved and you need to have a lot of patience with him and to explain to him and to go all the way with him to explain to him what it means that there is nothing except of Hashem. If you still see people as people and you don't recognize people by their souls and you don't see that they are souls that are struggling to come back to Hashem, to go back to their roots, to their source, you will never going to find an advice for them. Because that is who that they really are. And if you recognize them as something else, how are you going to answer their questions? You don't even know who they are. How are you going to know who they are before you know yourself? That's why you need to check who you are. And what's your purpose? 
and who you really are inside. And for that you must do it Buddha do it. And then maybe you can call yourself Hasid. Maybe. Got the message? Thank you very much. This world, in this period of time, we have a mission. What's the mission? The mission is only not to forget the Creator, to remember that it's all Him, never to fall in the trap of all of those coverings, of all of those husks. husks.